Well, greetings and salutations, test takers. This is Dean Tenney, also known as the Series 7 Guru, here for our Tuesday night weekly live stream Q&A. Any content you uh, would like to discuss, any questions from any FINRA or NAS exam, this is the time and the place for that. We have our very, always very special guest, uh, Brian Lee, the Test Geek himself, managing member of Test Geek Exam Prep LLC, and he's here to uh, uh, help us out as well. So tell us what serious exam you're taking, uh, where you're joining us from, and uh, Brian and I are still working on getting our last episode done of our podcast series. So uh, we just put that on the calendar. So if you're a 66 person, uh, be looking for that uh, next week sometime. I'm uh, working independently on my Series 7 exam podcast series, and uh, there is a new episode on options available on that. If you do have a question for Brian or myself or both of us, uh, please let us know what exam. It's not a big deal, but if you think about it, if you can first tell us what exam the question is from, for example, SIE or you know Series 7, followed with a capital Q in your question, then Brian and I don't have to guess like, okay, are they taking this exam? Because, you know, I'm teaching a three-day SIE. And if you're joining me from the class, welcome, my uh, Kaplan SIE students. Uh, but there are overlaps. And the overlap sometimes is the same. But sometimes the 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 flavor is different, I guess, as I would say that. The, the concept is tweaked a little bit. So that's helpful for us. Uh, the best free supplement to your paid study materials is my YouTube channel. But if you're looking for a paid supplement, can't beat a Kaplan Q bank. A Kaplan Q bank for the seven 3,600 questions with my Guru 15 discount code comes in about 55 bucks. And if you're looking for an all in paid supplement with videos, PDF, covers all the material, uh, Brian has been kind enough to give our viewers a 20% discount on his content. That's Guru 20. So that's all in on his paid supplement, videos, PDFs, all that stuff, practice exam. I think a little over 100, Brian, I think with the discount somewhere. Yeah, in the uh, this live stream, if you miss us, is available as a podcast on Spotify afterwards. If you're using the channel as a free supplement, it's a buffet. Take what you like, leave what you don't. But you find your series, you find your playlist. For example, the SIE has three playlists. The playlists are in suggested watch order. The videos in are, are suggested watch, watch order. If you're looking for a particular topic, you just go to the channel search bar, put in margin, accrued interest, whatever, and everything we have available uh, will pop up. So if you're binging, use the playlist. If you're looking for a particular thing, uh, put it in the channel search bar. It's self-service. Don't ask me to send you a list of five videos on whatever. Uh, we do a drawing at the end of the uh, uh, session. It's a 30-minute coaching call. It's February 8, 345. You need to claim that within an hour. Then you get the Zoom invite. You can share it. You can uh, you know, uh, assign it to someone else. You can do whatever you'd like. It's uh, videoed and we share it with others. If you're looking for some replays on some coaching calls, there are some good ones. I don't know Nico's in here, but Nico did a uh, coaching call. I think we got through 20 questions on Muni's options. And I believe, what else did we do? Mutual funds. And boy, he was he was killing it. So uh, you can watch those replays if you uh, would like. I do offer free content. Everything on the channel is free. But on my booking page, I do have some free content. I have the live stream over time, which follows not always, not this week. Uh, Tuesday, but next Tuesday, a Zoom session that's capped at 10. And so if you want to register for that, you can go under classes in the booking page and you'll see that free uh, opportunity. I also offer free office hours for paid students. That would include my Kaplan students. And you can also access that uh, there as well. All right. So let's see what we got go cool uh, going on here in the uh, comments. Let me kill that banner. Boom. And comments. Uh, greetings and salutations, Amando. Currently working on my SIE. All right, cool. First leg of your testing journey. So uh, welcome. I always say on that first leg of your testing journey, uh, make sure you try to overlearn it. Because if you overlearn it, it's going to pay huge dividends on your Series 6 or 7 if you're going on. Uh, Mary, uh, two eyes. I'm over That's Mary, uh, one of our regulars. Thank you so much for joining us. I don't know if I would call Brian a gentleman. <laughs> he is most certainly a gentleman. I may not be a gentleman, but, you know, he's a gentleman for sure. I was teasing him about his gentlemanly look. You know, like a collared sweater. Series 66, uh, investment advisor representative. Woohoo! So uh, that's uh, thanks for joining us from LinkedIn. Our primary platform 
is uh, YouTube. But we do broadcast to Facebook, LinkedIn, and I guess I got to start calling it X. So you can find us on all those very plas- various platforms. So thanks so much, you LinkedIn people, Facebook people, from joining us. Uh, there's Nico. Nico is killing it. Uh, I'm telling you, that guy has worked his butt off. And it's just such a big, uh, it's an amazing sense of gratification to see people who are dedicated, they're disciplined, they're organized, and how much they can improve their performance. Uh, Dave Costa, SIE Series 760. Man, that's crazy. Wow. <laughs> Dave, Dave Bryan won the, the coaching call, which is scheduled the following week. But he was taking his, uh, I think it was the, the diner, the 10, the last leg of his testing journey. And I was so jammed up and I was trying so hard to get a hold of him. And unfortunately, I didn't get a hold of him until he already had passed. But that's the good news. It could have been worse. I could have got to him after he uh, missed his mark. So, uh, Dave, it's always very gratifying. Uh, Brian and I both, when we help people, uh, you know, make their marks on these exams, it's just a, a huge gratification. And so kudos. What is that testing journey? One, two, three, four, five testing victories. And you know what we do, Dave? Uh, this is from It's a Wonderful Life. and A Wonderful Life, the best banking movie you ever have seen. If you uh, don't understand banking, watch It's a Wonderful Life. Best movie ever made on banking. Anyways, in that movie, uh, Clarence the Angel, when uh, somebody does a good deed, uh, they get their wings, they ring a bell. And so we, we too ring a bell, not for angels getting their wings, but for people passing their tests. Now, I don't know why you wouldn't want to trust Brian and I about content. But you can verify with our victorious test takers in chat. So if you're uh, taking a test and you want to you know, talk to somebody in a similar situation, uh, maybe Dave would be kind enough to respond to you. Uh, hi, Dean. Just passed my seven last Friday. Thanks to your videos. Thanks a lot. Uh, Donata, Jake, uh, again, very gratifying. I'm glad you found the videos helpful. Uh, like I say, we like to uh, think that we can contribute to some testing victories. So uh, thanks for letting us know. Chicago. I love Chicago, Mary. I spent a lot of time teaching 24s in Chicago. Uh, a lot of people would take the train down uh, from Milwaukee. They were big 24 classes. And I, man, I had it wired. I could fly in uh, to uh, uh, Midway, catch the, the train, be in downtown Chicago in about an hour, uh, have a nice uh, Friday night in Chicago, teach the class, and be back in uh, no time flat. I taught a series seven on the Wacker Drive. Remember that? Wacker. I taught series seven on Wacker Wacker Drive. Yeah, Wacker's in the loop. Yeah, that's where uh, the predecessor company Kaplan used to be uh, located. We used to do the uh, rendezvous. We never, you know, uh, the ins- instructor core back in the day of the predecessor company Kaplan was it once a year or two, two twice a year we get together in Chicago. Uh once I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah those were the days. Those yeah. were the days. They were fun. Yeah. What is the difference between the 66 and the 63? So, Colby, the 63 is an agent of a broker-dealer. An agent of the broker-dealer. So, if you get a 763 or 663, you're an agent of the broker-dealer. A 66 is an agent of both the broker-dealer and an investment advisor representative. I would tell you that the 66 doesn't do anything for you unless you have a seven. So a seven is a prerequisite to a 66. Now, some people get a 63, 65. Those are primarily people getting sixes, 663, 65, and that allows you to represent both as well. Uh, Brian likes, it got his board. Let me give uh, Brian his board there. Yeah. Yeah, What do you got on the board there? You got 63 agent. Yeah, love it. 66, I think that's it. Now, you don't have to have a seven to have a 63. You could have a six as, as well. Right. Right. So, if you have a choice, I don't know, Colby, if you get a choice, but if you are getting a seven, I would recommend a 66. That would be, you know, if you have a choice. Sometimes we don't have choices. Sometimes, you know. All right, Rosie, General Securities Principal coming this Saturday. Love it. Love it. You know, uh, Brian had some great uh, advice for somebody that was taking their uh, 910. I think it's the same advice. Uh, we would suggest, Rosie, in that 24, always answer to the benefit of the customer and not to the benefit of the broker dealer. I think I'm paraphrasing. Is that kind of what you said, Brian? Yeah, that's, that's pretty yeah. much it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a big generalization. But, you know, yeah. if you get stuck, that's kind of how you get unstuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Nico, 73 on the mastery. That's great, Nico. I wow. think you're right where you need to be. 
84. We just got to stick the landing, my friend, as I told you. He needs just to take his test tomorrow. He's done. He's good. Yeah, good yeah I think you're good. Uh, what's tomorrow? Tomorrow's Wednesday. So I'm with Brian. Make sure you don't wear yourself out. We just want to own, you know, good. you're where you need to be. So, yeah. Uh, February 15th, Riley, pretty nervous. Well, I don't know why you would have reason to be nervous unless you're, you know, is, can you help us with uh, quantifying the level of nervousness? Is it, does it have some basis in fact? I mean, have you done a practice exam and done poorly or have you done a quiz and done, done poorly? Is there some reason for you to be nervous? If so, you know, if you share, if you're in chat and you're sharing, so just remember, you may not want to put your business out there, but uh, you know, I think, a certain level of nervousness, fear, and anxiety is helpful, but you don't want it to be debilitating, right? You want to still be able to matriculate into scoring position and get that, as Brian calls it, is the P. So just make sure you try and manage that as best you can. Chicago, Chicago is my kind of town. Uh, hi, Dean and Brian. Just passed 66 today. All right. An investment advisor representative. Woo! House. Got the P. Got yeah. the P. Uh, hey, we love being on that with your testing journey. Uh, Jessica, it's been so gratifying to me that we have people like yourself. We just got Dave, five legs of the testing journey. When I started the channel, we're going into our fourth year, and we had uh, seven content, and that was pretty much it. But now I just uh, love that we have some people who have used the channel to matriculate all the way through their exams, all those testing victories. How exciting, how exciting. So another victorious test taker in the house, Dave, Jessica, thank you so much for circling back and uh, sharing uh, the victory with others because I think it's so good for morale uh, on these Tuesdays when we do have victorious test takers who pop in and share their victories. You know, somebody's out there struggling, you know, uh, we just had somebody said there you have a, a nervousness and, you know, we got people like Nico on their way to getting their, uh, their P and making their mark and working. And we got people already have done it. So, woo -hoo, so, so exciting. Uh, hi, Dean and Brian just passed my SIE on the second attempt. I always say you pass two tests, the SIE and a test of resiliency. Any uh, advice on which one I should do next? Seven or 66, easy seven. Yep. Seven. <laughs> I don't know why people want to be different. So Yasha there. I've seen people on social media recommending people do things in odd sequences. And, I, you know, why overthink the damn thing? Get the seven. It'll pay dividends on your 66. So I can't think of any reason to take a 66 before seven unless you don't have sponsorship. Other than that, you should take your seven. How important are margin accounts? Not at all. Three or four margin account uh, questions max. Uh, they are straightforward. Every vendor goes completely overboard on margin. I mean, it's just Brian and I get so aggravated because, you know, we know that you're not going to encounter the vast majority of the circumstances they present you with. Uh, you know, exam FX, uh, past perfect. I know past perfect. There's some people, Christian, who unfortunately uh, are in a locked, I think it's called lock program, where they can't move on to unit 19 unless they do unit 18. And this was past perfect. And literally, you know, he's paying me to do margin practice questions that he's never going to see. But, you know, I did have a good margin question, though, Christian, I put up uh, on the channel here recently. I thought it was a hellacious one, but, you know, three or four. Make sure you know the documentation, classical margin equation, long and short. You should be good. Let me say it another way. If you tell me, Kristen, that you missed the seven because of margin, I'm going to say, eh, I don't think so. I think you had bigger problems elsewhere, my friend. In fact, my lecture is called Don't Overdose on Margin. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Hi, Dean and Brian. Cups of gala. Passed my seven last week. Woohoo! Woo Thank you for getting the SIE, the seven. Pass first try. What's next? It looks like we're missing one leg of the testing journey there. My guess is that you have one more testing victory to go. Either you're 63. Or your 66 would be my guess, but maybe you're taking a refresh and reset before you jump in there, before you jump in there. I usually don't have adult beverages during the week, but as Brian says in the there's an exception. I passed the 65. Woo! -hoo! Kudos, investment advisor, representative. I love it on your first eye, Rob. Excellent. 
Uh, maybe, uh, Brian, we talk about adult beverages too more, too much, because I know now in my feed, like on Facebook, they're starting to feed me like ice cubes that I can make into my my name. And you know, I wonder how they're picking that up. <laughs> There's a lot of these stuff. Dean, we're going to have to have an adult beverage this Friday evening uh, for Rob. There you go. We will hoist an adult beverage in your honor, Rob. So uh, Brian and I have a uh, sometimes Friday routine, not every Friday, but you know, he, I did tease him. He's got a life outside of Friday nights with Dean. So <laughs> sometimes, and then, you know, sometimes he has a life outside of our Tuesday, uh, you know, uh, live stream. Joining from Boston. All right. Uh, Boston, home of Fidelity. You know, Fidelity has operations all around the country, but yeah, headquarters is there. Uh, I did a lot of Fidelity classes in the World Trade Center for years, Brian. Finally, I told Fidelity, listen, I don't want to be a corporate trainer. This is not a long-term solution to your, <laughs> your problem with nines and tens and 24s. You, you know, need to hire somebody. But uh, they used to have a division called Spartan at Fidelity, which was their high-end thing. And Brian, they had a closet with the best Chotskys I've ever seen. Really? You know, paperweights and you know, golf balls. And uh, man, it was, it was some good stuff. Taking the 66 next week. Taking my full practice exam today. I love it. What did we score? Did we get a score here? We would like a score. We'd like to be in the mid-70s. I've been taking a lot of quizzes. Uh, I don't know if this is the case. So I'm just going to put it out there. Be careful. I have been finding uh, isolated examples where people spend too long quizzing and don't get to a practice test soon enough. So seven, 10 days out, we want you to be doing practice tests. Uh, what's your feeling, Brian? Do you have people who just delay taking a a, a final uh, test and inventory? Yeah, and I get, you know how I can be <clears throat> very pleasant with- Yes, very else. straightforward. Yeah, you're, you're not obtuse at all. <laughs> and, you know, within that seven to 10 day window before the test date, it has to be practice file. And, right, it's not just- the goal is doing as many practice finals as possible. That's not its purpose. Yes. It's to evaluate and find out where the remaining holes are. Evaluate. Yeah. Right. With the performance tracker, find those weak spots. Yeah. And then you want to remediate, right? You don't want to wait too long to find out you have, uh, you know, areas that need improvement. So I'm with Brian on that. So, you know, that but Kaplan has a performance tracker that is pretty good at doing that. I think the Kaplan QBank is the best, but yeah, I think STC has something similar. So, you know, if your your vendor has that available to you, make sure you take make full use of that. So if you're if if you have, it sounds like you have several hours yeah, yeah. a day, probably one practice final a day is yeah, fine. I think two is a little much. I'd rather yeah. you do two one in the morning and remediate on that, just as would yeah, exactly. be my recommendation rather than two a day. Because right. that second one, I've had a person like doing three or four that that second, third, or fourth, you're going to get diminishing returns on the mark. What we're trying to do is get a mark on where you're at. And right. they become That's less reliable if you do too many of them, I guess is what I would say. Yeah, just too much. Yeah. So two a day is a little much, I think. Yeah. One a day is... Uh, can you please exp explain the difference between uh, retail communication and public appearance? So it depends on the public appearance, but retail communication is more than 25 prospects or clients in a 30 day period. And that requires principal approval pre-distribution. The public appearance would be based on the context. What kind of public appearance is it? And whether or not it's going to require approval, but it certainly requires supervision would be the answer. Public appearance would require supervision. You wanna add anything to that to Brian? Yeah, I, you know, I, I keep thinking about whether it's scripted or not scripted. Yeah. Public yeah. appearance. Uh, there has to be procedures in place by the firm for these non-scripted public appearance. So, you know, th th there's no real kind of thing about pre-approval in a public appearance, yeah, but it yeah. definitely has to be supervised and there definitely have to be procedures in place by the broker dealer to cover yeah. those public appearances. And I, I would comment that, that 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 script or those slides could be retail communication, depending on if gotcha. you know the audience or don't know the audience, right? Uh, good evening. I test on Friday, uh, Series 65, Investment Advisor Rep. High 70s, right where you need to be, Casey. What do you think? I think rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. This is what, Tuesday? So, uh, you know, you have Wednesday and Thursday. I don't know if you're a full-time studier, but uh, basically you need to fold up shop uh, Thursday afternoon, get a good night's rest and go down there and make your mark, right? So I think that's great. 
Uh, I think Brian and I both agree that's where we would want you to be on those high seventies. Yeah. Uh, other, for, your firm probably wants you in the nineties, but I don't. I don't even think that's productive if you're getting a ninety because you've memorized, you know, questions and answers. Do you need sponsorship for the sixty-six, Mary? You do not. You won't be an advisor with, without a seven. But let me two separate questions. Do you need sponsorship to take and pass a sixty-six? The answer is no. Can you be an advisor with just a sixty-six? The answer is no. You have to be affiliated with an investment advisory firm. And remember the 66, while you can take it and pass it, does not allow you to conduct the business without a seven. If you are trying to uh, get an exam where you can work without sponsorship, I would get the 65. So Mary, with a 65, you don't need sponsorship to take it. And it works by itself if you can find a job at a registered investment advisor firm. Uh, Brian in the Northwest, there's a huge firm up in, well, I guess now they've moved to Texas, but Fisher Investments, those men and women have 65s, right? And so they don't, they don't make commissions. They, you know, the firm gets fees and they, they are 65. So I would marry, depending on your, your context and what you're trying to attempt to do, if you're trying to just get a license that works without sponsorship, I would go 65 and then you still need to find an investment advisory firm, but you have the right registration. If you get the 66, you won't be able to do anything with it until you get a seven, which means you're going to have to find somebody to sponsor you. But I would say, Mary, that if you have a, you know, SIE and a 66, you become a lot less speculative in terms of human capital, right? I mean, if you're coming for an interview and you already have an SIE and a 66, I say, poof, I plug you into a seven and we're rocking and we're rolling. So any comments on that, Brian? Uh, I'm just kind of thinking about, you know, we get these questions quite a bit, you know, because where does the SIE and the six and the seven and the 63, 60, and where, and so I'm just thinking in my head, you know, kind of delineating all that. But <laughs> yeah, if, yeah you, if you don't have sponsorship and you're looking to be an advisor, it's got to be the 65. You, there's no point in doing a 66 unless you have a broker dealer and therefore sponsorship for the seven. Other than that, just do the 65. Yeah, I think that the 65 has more utility, I think, I guess is what I would say. It does, yes. Yeah. Uh, any recommendations on what I can complement the 65 with? Here's another one. You have a mortgage license. If you know any combinations, I, I don't. Um, again, the 65, uh, it does not work without an investment advisory firm somewhere. Uh, Rob, if you don't have your SIE, you could certainly add that to the mix. Uh, but again, uh, a 65, a lot of people have 663, 65. But the 65 is one that works without those, uh, you know, other exams or registration. So, uh, I don't know. You have anything that complements the 65? I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and again, it depends on the firm. You know, that's all fee-based advisory business. Yeah. What other license could you complement? Depends on if you have the broker dealer. And then you could go, just like Dean said, the 6 and 63 route. And this is all commission-based, such as variable annuities, mutual funds, yeah, those yeah. sorts of things. Uh, but again, you need broker dealer sponsorship to do this. And you can also do 763. If you have the 65, a 6365 is the equivalent of a 66. Correct. Hi, LinkedIn user. Hi, LinkedIn uh, user. Uh, you worked around there. Cool. Like, man, I tell you, I was in Boston. Did get really cool. I was in Boston one time. I threw my cup of coffee up and it froze before it hit the ground. I mean, that is. Cool. <laughs> uh, good evening, guys. Making my way through the Series 6. I uh, was thinking, I know there's a lot of overlap, but I was thinking a helpful video would be a content outline from FINRA for Series 6, like I did for the SIE. Isaac, you have that, Brian? Do you? <laughs> a content outline for the 6? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're paid, you're, yeah. Video content for the 6? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. I have that too. Uh, my my ver versions of those are free where I do the content outline. I have not done that for the 6. But Brian has his paid supplements where he does the entire 6 in video form. It does come with a PDF where he has like what do you call them class notes, class notes, quick notes where he does exactly that, yeah. you know. So he you know kind of spells it out for it. He has a practice exam as well. So uh, check out Brian's uh, paid supplement for the Series Six. It's excellent. Uh, he also has a good uh, test, uh, final practice test that we have on the channel. And I think someday I want to do that. I do feel like we have not uh, put up as, mu as much content up for sixes as we have for other folks. Uh, just past the 63, dang the 65, a lot of overlap on 65. Uh, areas to focus on, uh, I would say disclosures and unethical business practices, much like the 63. 
Uh, Brian, you have any uh, investment vehicles? Investment vehicles, it's amazing. Analysis, yeah, which you don't get on the sixty-three. Yeah. Uh, Brian and I did uh, a, a podcast episode on the 65 that people found very helpful. helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go to the 65 playlist, there's, uh, I think there's three of them. But one of those is a, a podcast that Brian and I did. Check that podcast out. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, check out the comments in the videos too. Sometimes that can be uplifting. Yeah. Sometimes you can find some uh, more test content in those comments. Uh, but well, we've had a lot of positive feedback on that 65 podcast playlist. I'll tell you what I'll do, LinkedIn user. I'll link it in the video replay. So uh, in this, uh, uh, when this is over, at the top, I usually link to the videos that came up in the context of our live stream. And I will link to that 65 uh, podcast playlist for you. Uh, Rosie, I've been watching your videos on the 7 as a refresher before my 24, because it's been four years. Yeah, sometimes that's the challenge. It's not bad. Yeah, uh, trouble with understanding a stabilizing bid. So I'll give it a shot and then I'll turn it over to uh, Brian. Uh, stabilization is a legal form of pegging. You know, pegging outside of the context of a firm commitment underwriting is going to be a prohibited practice and is gonna be market manipulation. But, you know, if I'm Morgan Stanley, I'm the head of the syndicate, I'm taking Facebook public at 38. If we have too many people who are selling back into the offering and it falls below 38, no, nobody's buying our new stock at 38 when they can get it at 36 or 34. So what I'm going to do is one member of the syndicate is going to be a stabilization agent. And we're going to put in a stabilizing bid at 38. That way the stock is not going to fall below 38. And, during, you know, we're making a bona fide distribution of the security. Now, the 24 for Morgan Stanley, Rosie, in this scenario is a guy named Michael Grimes. And Michael Grimes came out after the Facebook. It was sticky, not testable. It's not a test term. It's an industry term. The IPO in this case stands for it's probably overpriced. But anyways, he came out and said, listen, the syndicate spent $200 million stabilizing the Facebook offering. Tomorrow we'll be uh, removing our stabilizing bid and it will find its natural price which it was like 19. When they asked Zuckerberg about it, he said, I don't care. As far as I understand a firm commitment underwriting, that's the syndicate stock at 38. And it sounds like their problem, not mine. See, you wouldn't want to be you, which is a good understanding. So what are the test questions on your 24 about stabilization, Rosie? First, it can only be used in a firm commitment underwriting. Second, it has to be in the prospectus that we may stabilize the issue. Better to have it in the prospectus and, and not need it than need it and not have it. Test question, only one member of the syndicate can enter the stabilizing bid. Test question, it has to be at or below the public offering price. So I hope you found that helpful. I do have a 24 playlist as well. And I do co uh, cover that, uh, both stabilization and the illegal form version of it called picking. Uh, Brian, you got your whiteboard there. Anything you want to add to that? Let me just show. No, you, you got it. Perfect. Yeah, okay. I, I can't add anything to that. Okay. Yep. I don't think I missed anything there, Rosie. I think that's pretty much it. I mean, yeah. uh, Blake, uh, looking to take the Series 52 Municipal Representative Sunday in the spring. Any thoughts on that exam? Yeah. You know, those muni exams are tough. I mean, a lot of minutia. You know, the MSRB, Blake, has administrative rules, A rules, definitional rules, D rules, and general rules, G rules. And I don't think anybody is offering that anymore. Solomon, it was funny. I bought, somebody wanted tutoring Blake on the 52, and I, I bought the uh, Solomon version because they were the few people still offering it. And uh, no sooner did I buy it than Jer Jeremy Solomon said, what are you up to, Dean? I thought, well, yeah, I didn't realize I had that high a profile. You tutoring somebody? I said, yeah, I am, as a matter of fact. So uh, I like Solomon. I think they've been purchased by Pass Perfect. So I'm not sure uh, who your uh, vendor is. But all the Muni exams, Blake, really just minutia. So just you know, uh, I wish you well. But boy, those those are those aren't fun for sure. Think you have any comments on the 52, Brian? No, I don't. Uh, I wonder who uh, who he's using for the 52. Yeah, yeah, I'd be interested. That's you know, it's unfortunate, but a lot of test prep vendors don't want to provide. Uh, content for it where you know where there's not numbers to justify it so you know you know the the publishers in series seven still have almost enough content yeah i i agree i agree yeah, i mean i agree because the seven make you a stockbroker mary in the old days that was what we called the series Seven, the stockbroker's exam 
right? So I don't know if anybody has still used the old fashioned term stockbroker, but yeah. uh, when I came into the business in the eighties, I considered myself a stockbroker. Yeah. I, I think that's a misnomer, a, mis, a misnaming of the exam because if they're truth and labeling, it should be called the bond brokers exam because there's a lot more questions on bonds than there are stocks. But yeah, in the old days, series sevens were called stockbrokers. My current title is client relationship manager. Yeah, I don't know if anybody calls ourselves a stockbroker, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm allowed to call yourself a stockbroker. There you go, throwback. <laughs> you know, maybe there might be some older clients go, hey, an old fashioned stockbroker. Wow. <laughs> Uh, any advice before taking the series seven? How should you approach suitability questions? Suitability questions, I think, are some of the harder questions because the three levels of questions you get on the exam are recognition, practical application, and judgment. And a lot of the suitability questions are judgment questions. I think that you really should try and overlearn the product knowledge because if you know products, then you're better at including or excluding recommendations. For example, if they say... Uh, your client needs liquidity. You go, well, okay, partnerships out of there. They say they're an uncomfortable high tax track. I go, oh, Muni. So I would want you to really focus on investment products so you can use that as your pivot to these judgment questions about suitability. Brian, your your thoughts? That's exactly. And you and I have talked about this many times. Yeah. It's your knowledge of investment products first, right? Knowing yeah. that common stock most often is used for growth or capital appreciation. And then, of course, there's different variations. And then, of course, you get income and, you know, corporate bonds and corporate yeah. bond base. I, I do have, and I will link to you, I have a suitability playlist. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have four videos in that suitability playlist. There's a, a suitability practice exam. There's a suitability exercise. And then I have the the uh, doppel, well, not doppel there. What would be the reverse? Anyways, I have the unsuitable you know, <laughs> exercise where we uh, do that. And I forget what the fourth one, but there's four videos in that playlist. And I will link to it uh, in the video uh, description after that. Yeah, I have a little timeline um, in my Series 7 video course. Do you? Do you? There you go. So, And I match up the products, uh, the objectives with the products and the risks. That's, that's, that's gold. That's gold. Uh, that's kind of what I do in video format. But boy, if you, know, if you can get that's it in a written format, that's great. Uh, after 7 or 6, are there any other exams worth considering for a financial planner. Yeah, I don't know if you want to complicate your life. I mean, you know, the other exams would be supervising others who have sevens and 66. And I'm not sure if that's, you know, in, what something you're interested in doing, but uh, you know, if you're going to be having a team or supervising a team, uh, maybe nine, 10 or 24, but uh, there's no need for any other additional exams. What are your thoughts, Brad? That allows you to do everything. Seven yeah, and six. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you want to supervise. Yeah. yeah. Riley has uh, done the quiz and the practice exams. Great. Great. What uh, scores you want to share? What are you getting on your practice exams? Uh, is the Mometrics book enough for the material, Ray? I don't think so. I think it's a good value, but I don't think there's enough there. So as a supplement, I think it's a pretty cheap supplement and comes with, I think, uh, five different practice exams. Nico and I did one of them. And uh, we thought, Ray, it was kind of funky. I mean, I like some of the questions on there. Uh, you'll have Kaplan soon. Kaplan is the much better uh, primary study material source. Uh, but Mometrics, I think, is a good uh, value for a paid supplement, but I wouldn't feel comfortable telling you that that's enough to get you through the exam. Uh, I'm nervous when I take tests. I passed the SE first time. Everyone in my office passed first time. Filling the pressure. Uh, got a 70 pass perfect. Well, good news, right? Pass perfect is, man, they are bare. So you can easily count on five more questions on, on the actual exam that pass perfect because they have, you know, some very obtuse, obtuse questions. So I would feel good with a 70 on pass perfect. Brian, I would like you in the mid seventies. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, Brian, are you willing to make an exception for pass perfect? Or? Yes, I am. I absolutely am. It's far diff more difficult yeah. than yeah. your average publisher. Uh, hey, Dean, taking seven on Monday. How far in depth convertible bonds? You should not, Omar, be struggling with parity. You can't be fumbling around with parity. So when you get the conversion price, you need the conversion ratio. You got to know how to calculate parity. I don't know of any draw, Omar, in which you're not going to get at least one parity question. So if you want that point, that's how far in depth you got to go. You got to have a mastery of parity, either parity of the stock or parity of the bond. So it is definitely there. Uh, maybe two, but for sure one. What do you think, Brian? 
That's exactly right. I, I tell people one to three, but there, it's definitely there. No doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, certain things, Omar, I guess what I would add to that is when, you know, people like Brian and myself tell you it's there. You know, yeah. angels weep for you if you then don't, you're not prepared. I mean, you know, the test is hard enough when you, you know, stuff that you aren't expecting. So there are certain things that we know are there. And you want to make sure you do it. Now, when I take a test, we we're talking, Riley, about anxiety. And, you know, I hope this happens for you. Well, I like when I'm having anxiety and I'm taking the test, I like Omar to get to the first question. I know I know the right answer. I say, all oh, right, something on this exam I know. You know, hopefully I'm not 20, 30 deep before something looks familiar, right? Uh, I, in this case, Omar would like parody right out of the gate. I go, bam, you know, there's my one point for that. Can you get hired with uh, for the firm with just an SIE? Yes, Chris. Listen, I got hired with nothing. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, yeah. And in theory, Chris, you should have a step up because the firm knows that they're not going to have to uh, spend resources uh, getting you an SIE. So sure. Uh, I would look for an opportunity where the, their sponsorship and the expectation is you're going to take a, a 763 or 766. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Allie, I missed the seven by 5%. I retest on Friday. I'm getting 68 to 74. You have two more days of studying. You're totally freaking out. Well, uh, I like those scores. I'd like to push them a little higher, but if you're uh, testing, let's see, two more days of studying. So Friday, um, don't, don't wear yourself out, but if you can do another practice exam Wednesday and get another mark and it's in that 70 range, we should feel good. I have every expectation, even a 68 on Kaplan, you're going to pass more often people do than they don't. We, we would prefer that we don't see anything below 70, but there's no reason to freak out. So uh, if I were a betting person, I had to, uh, a person I was talking to and we had six people between 60 and 70 on a practice test score. And I said, you know, we're going to lose three of them. And she goes, who are they? So we can save them. I go, well, it's statistics. I don't know who they are. If we knew who they were. We, we would <laughs> save them. But the sad thing is if the, the three we're going to lose, it's not because they couldn't pass. It's just because they're going to freak out. Uh, freak out, there's that word. And they're going to go wobbly instead of finishing strong. And Ali, what I was so pleased about it is they proved me wrong. All six of them. Uh, that was Friday, all past Monday. And they just kept with it. They, you know, didn't get down on themselves, tried to keep as a positive mental attitude as possible, and they got it done. So I have every expectation. We're going to hear from you Tuesday that you passed on Friday, right? Uh, what do you think? 90, 10, that somebody below 70 passes or even a higher percentage, Brian? Do you have a percentage on that? I don't, not for under 70. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Remember the performance tracker, though. Let's do some. Oh, yeah, work. yeah, Allie. So you got Kaplan. So look at that performance tracker and see if there's a honey hole there somewhere. You know, what well, you're hoping it's counterintuitive, but you're hoping that you find an area where you're really weak because if you can fix that, you know, if you're almost passing everything, that's harder to fix than if you're like, oh, man, there's it. Man, I got it. Illinois. Looks like we got a lot of people from Illinois. Hi, Ivy. I think, Ivy, I think you want a coaching call. We're still trying to get that done. So reach out to me. Let me know when you want to get that 66 done. Uh, Nico. A uh, company has $50 million of convertible bonds. Convertible at 50. So the first thing, Nico, you got to do is you got to figure out how many uh, shares that is. So you take 1,000 divided by 50. The conversion ratio is 20. Uh, the current market value of the stock is 42. It claims a 10% stock dividend. Now, I can tell you, Brian, he's going into I hate vendor uh, rant, right? Because he doesn't think you're going to see this on the test, neither do I. Uh, but we're going to take 10% times 20. 10% times 20. How about I get to 20 to 20 shares? And that means I want two additional shares. So I'm so now going to want 22 shares. And now, Nico, I can solve the question. I take the 1,000 uh, par, and I divide by the 22 shares, and the new uh, conversion price is 45.45. Uh, the current market value had nothing to do with answering that question. It had nothing to do with answering that question. So, uh, carnival 50, that's 20 shares of the common. The bond indenture, that is testable. That's the covenants between the issuer and the trustee for the benefit of the bondholders. Uh, I want to be able to convert into the same percentage. If they declare a 10% stock dividend, I want my bond uh, adjusted accordingly. 10% of 20, I want two more shares. I want a total of 22 shares. 1,000 by 22 is 45.45. Brian, do you want to do your rant or not? 
very quickly. I, <laughs> I, I had this just yesterday with a tutoring guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. He was at his cabin in Sisters, Oregon. Yeah. Uh, log cabin, beautiful log cabin. And I told him the story when you and I first started. I started in the early 90s. Yeah. And the practice questions were still in a manual. Yeah. And this question came up. This was in 1992. I started teaching this in 1995. It's still in that manual. It's still in the QBank. <laughs> And in 27 years, I've never had one person ever see a non-dilutive covenant question ever show up. Nico, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I have an episode in my podcast series where I go on the same rant with Brian. I call them legacy questions. Right. Legacy questions are questions that all vendors uh, have for, in their Q banks that come from the old days. And I get it, Nico. Nobody wants to you know, get rid of questions and say they have a smaller Q bank. So I call these legacy questions. There's questions. And uh, I think, I don't know, Nico, when we were doing that practice exam together on a shared screen, I know that when I do this with uh, people, I do comment and when those questions where I say, okay, yeah, that used to be testable. I haven't had anybody tell me they've seen it in years. So uh, you just got to know that. So uh, I, I'm with Brian, uh, you know, so what's that collective? I mean, there's many years? people who have math anxiety. You know, why take them through all the math when you know it's not going to be? So, yeah, yeah, you know, make sure, like I think, uh, Nico, remember we said you got to be able to do parity for sure. Yeah, so adjusting, adjusting the convertible. By the way, the other thing that drives me nuts about this, Brian, now, now I'm going to start on my rant. Nico, the other thing that drives me that nuts about that is it's more important to know the conversion ratio of 22 shares than it is to be able to reset the, the conversion price. The conversion price intellectually is meaningless in terms of doing the math. So that's the other reason I hate this, because they're actually making you go down a road that it doesn't really uh, exist. Uh, Jen, is it a good trick or exercise to remember the formulas for calculating uh, yields? I can do the math if I remember what it is. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I am not good at memorizing formulas. Uh, I know that when I'm doing math, if I just do it enough, I, then one time I don't need to refer to my notes or the formula or whatever the case is. So I don't know. Um, I would prefer you understand the math if you understand the math, then your brain will have a less problem. But should you memorize that uh, annual dividend by current market prices, current yield? I don't know, Jen. I will link to a video. Pay attention to the lecture title. All the math necessary to pass the Series 7. Now, Brian, I will in that video get people say, well, you didn't go over the theoretical value of a right trading X or cum. I said, well, look at the title again. All the math necessary and i haven't had brian you have anybody say they had to calculate the theoretical values of rights x or cum no. yeah there you go right so it's another one of those no, you the call. no one calculates yeah, 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 that's right. so, so jen check out that video i'll link it to you uh the math is there though i again i now gotta kind of backtrack we gotta be able to perform on math because the great thing about math there's no interpretation of a right answer you simply get it right or you get it wrong right? right so that's why break even things like that become important not because you know, it's difficult. It's just that it's not an interpretive answer, whereas those judgment questions are. In studying for the 24 on Friday, can you please review who gets dividends depending on the purchase or the settlement? Well, it's never based on the purchase. It's about being on the shareholder list on the record date, right? So if I buy the day before the X, I would be on the list. I'd get the dividend. Now, the 24, I would know that we screw this up sometimes. You know, on trades just prior to the X date, maybe we get decayed, and I should have been on the shareholder list, but I'm not. And so I would also know my 24 that in that situation, we're going to have a due bill. A due bill is an IOU to the buyer saying, we know you're entitled to the dividend, and we're working on it, and we'll get it to you. Now, depending on the uh, size of the dividend, it could change being one business day prior. For example, if the stock dividend you recall what it is, Brian, if the stock dividends are, I want to say 20%, then the X date is further out. There's some funky uh, X dates. Anyways, there's some funky X, -way X dates. Uh, but again, uh, I don't think you'll see that minutia on the 24. It's mainly making sure your reps aren't selling dividends on trades as part of the X on artificial sense of uh, uh, urgency. And then, no, it's not based ever on the trade date. Trade date has nothing to do with that. So when you read it terms. Settlement is when ownership changes hands. Now, Brian, you had some news. You said we're going to T plus one on corporate communities on 
Did you tell me that? Yeah, it's in May. Yeah. Man, man, May. Man. Plus one in May. Yeah. Mexico. Hey, I uh, got, I think it's you. Uh, thanks for joining us from LinkedIn. I apologize, but I just didn't have any time to book that uh, with you. If you're the same person, Mariana, I think. So, uh, buenas noches. Uh, boy, if I could teach this stuff as Espanol, Brian, I'd be rich. I might only have one student, but I could charge him a gazillion. Remember, remember our colleague, Angela? Yeah, he taught in Spanish. Spanish and Portuguese. Yeah, crazy. I have no aptitude. Anyways, I when I got to, if it's you, uh, Mariana, I think that's it. I actually thought it was my stepmother because she's from Mexico. And it, I, the, the thing came, an uh, international number. I go, oh, well, something's wrong with my dad. You know, what, what's his album? <laughs> I spent a lot of time in Ensenada, which is uh, in Baja. Hey there. Uh, Cups of Kama, between your YouTube videos and Brian's classes online, gave me all the confidence I needed. Woo! Thank you both so much. You are welcome. You are welcome. And yes, I'm on my 66 now using a lot of Brian's videos on this one. Brian is the champ on 66. He is so good at this NASA stuff. I mean, you know, he has one of his favorite terms, distillation. You know, oh, mashed potatoes and premium yeah. and, and, and cups of gallon. Not me, not so much. <laughs> I like to go, I'm a little more free form. I like to go everywhere, right? <laughs> right. Even though Nico, uh, you could tell when I was going to answer Nico's question, did you see that little pout that Brian went into? He was like, Why are you doing this? It's not on the test. <laughs> I'm using Kaplan. What would you recommend as best practice for mediation? Uh, we've said over and over again, uh, use the performance tractor. Uh, but then activities, all your activities, you know, your videos, your notes, your practice quizzes. What I would suggest, Rosie, is mix it, mix it up. Your brain will stay fresher if you mix, mix up your study effort or study activity, right? So if you just watch videos, your brain's going to shut down. You just do note, review notes, you're going to shut down. If you just do practice questions. So I would do uh, all of the above, potpourri, right? Do a video, then do notes, do practice quizzes, rotate, exactly. rotate back to a video. That's it. That's yeah, it. Rotate. Yeah, you find those weak areas on that performance tracker. You use Dean's videos or my videos, my quick notes. If you had to go back into the text on that little section, something like that, and maybe a custom quiz on that area, but no more than 10 to 12 questions because you don't want to get further into the weeds. Right, so right. once you establish your weak areas, this is our remediation, right? Once you establish the weak areas from the performance tracker, these are in combinations thereof, whichever combination you prefer, these are what you want to do to help bolster those weak areas. Yeah, bring them up. Bring them up to above par. Exactly. Above par. Uh, tuning in from Illinois. Got a lot of people from Illinois. Wow. Wow. Uh, cutting for the Series 65. All right. Uh, you're welcome. 65, you know, Brian and I both think, depending on your background, Courtney, that that can be a real challenge. Challenge. Uh, because exactly. there are some people taking the 65 who are tabula rasas, blank slates. They have never been exposed to any of this stuff. And boy, uh, there's a lot of stuff on 65 to be exposed to. So <laughs> yes. it could be a challenge. Well, thank you, John. I, I appreciate your participation in class. John is in my SIE class. And, uh, you know, nothing worse, you know, Brian, when you're teaching and you got nobody interacting or participating and we've got a pretty good SIE class. We get are getting a lot of participation. That's so a scary day. I appreciate that, John. Uh, taking Brian's exam tomorrow is my final practice. I, Nico, his exams are pretty spot on. So there should be strong uh, correlation. Listen, Nico, if you take exception to one of Brian's questions, <laughs> do not reach out to me. Brian is more than happy. If you think it's a gotcha question, I assure you it is not a gotcha question. But, you know, reach out to Brian. He's more than happy. I, I think I told you about that uh, situation, Brian, where we had a guy and he was swearing that uh, Brian had three questions that were wrong and he got a lower score on Brian. And, boy, he was, you know, whining pretty good. And I said, well, listen, don't whine about it. Either tell us what the three questions are or call Brian. I said, it's really important, by the way, because, you know, Brian's exams are meant, to, you know, we, we just had this discussion. Let me put it. I'm trying to say this in a way that doesn't get us into trouble. Um, Brian doesn't put anything on his practice exams, Nico, that he doesn't think you might see. So 
I will assure you tomorrow, Nico, on his exam, you aren't going to see the adjustment for a dilution in a convertible. Yeah. <laughs> no anti-dilutive covenant. But, but anyways, I told this guy, please reach out to Brian because have him explain it to you because you could encounter these three things tomorrow. And God knows, I don't want you to think, you know, that, uh, you know, you're wrong. Anyways, uh, he told me, Brian, good news. He passed. Good. I was more worried about his psyche. I told him that. And, uh, you know, he, uh, said, yeah, he just was, you know, going off the deep end, but good news. He made his mark. He made his mark. So let's see what cups of gold. We did that one. I think, uh, Nico, I have a hundred million shares, uh, common outstanding. You own a hundred thousand shares. You have a right to maintain proportion ownership. So you own 10% of that stock. So you would be entitled to 50,000 shares of the 500,000 shares. You have the first right of refusal on the issuance of new shares, right? So he will receive enough rights to buy. The answer to the question is 50,000 shares. Uh, I don't think you'll see that, Nico, but I would know that rights are short term and exercisable above the current market price. So that's what I would have. Yeah, let's see. It seems like I'm uh, lost some people here. Yeah, team, you, wow. You're, you're right. Right. I'm just trying to see where we're at. That was Nico looking for a scenario. Okay, we did that. Okay, we did that. There's Nico. We did that one. This is Nico again. There's Nico. Okay, I thought if I miss you, just put it back in the chat. Uh, yeah, I do believe there's more bond questions than stock questions, certainly. I mean, 20 easy on munis. If you add in corporate bonds and government bonds, I think you're definitely going to see that. So now remember, every draw is a little different, but, you know, yeah, you know, make sure you're solid on bonds for sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Fact, I'm not sure. 50,000 shares. Yeah, I just gave you the answer. That's right, Vince. And, you know, it's yeah. fun about these things. Everybody gets to participate. It's even more fun in our Zoom uh, overtime sessions because we have a whiteboard and, you know, we can do questions that Brian doesn't like. <laughs> um, can an employer give cash prize or game ticket to an RR who had the highest sale for variable annuities? Well, it's not best practice. FINRA, uh, is, you know, frowns on sales contests. The answer is yes, but with disclosure. In other words, I would have to disclose to you that there's a sales contest and, you know, I, I won the prize last year and it was a trip to, to, to Tahiti and I hope to win this year. It's a trip to Hawaii. But it's not about my trip to Hawaii. It's about you accomplishing your financial goals. Oh, that's easy, John. I would recommend Kaplan for sure. You know, I love Jeremy, but, you know, uh, Solomon and now part of Past Perfect. If I, John, didn't think Kaplan was the best, I wouldn't teach for Kaplan. Kaplan hires my LLC to uh, do classes for them. And I wouldn't be their authorized social media influencer. Ooh. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> 62 years old, and I'm an official social media influencer. <laughs> Who would have thought? Uh, getting 72 to 74, that's a great score. 212. I think you have plenty of time, Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us from Facebook. Uh, I always like to see Facebook, LinkedIn participants. Uh, any suggestions? I think just doing what you're doing looks like you're in a good spot. Uh, without more details, I'm not sure what I would recommend, but I think those scores that far out are pretty good. Brian, what do you think? Yeah, comprehensive test. Does that mean the, from the custom quizzes or is that yeah, practice the, test? Yeah, what does that mean? Yeah. If it's yeah. custom quizzes, that score is going to be significantly lower because they go far, far deeper yeah. in the content. The simulated exams will correlate a little bit more and should be higher than the custom scores. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think you're in a good spot. Yeah. Well, you're good. welcome, Cedric. You're welcome. We're here every Tuesday, 5 p.m. A married couple owns Class A shares. So Class A shares are good for people who have a large amount to invest, a long time horizon. Uh, one has an account with a value of 10. The other has a value of 20. So this is a married couple and joint tenants. I, I don't see a question here, but it looks like maybe it's a combination privilege and uh, you would be able to use the combination privilege. I'm guessing that's what this question is about. So that's 10, 20, and uh, 12. So what is that? 42,000. So depending on where the break point is on the class A shares, they may qualify. That's called a combination privilege that some funds offer. Do you think that's what it's about, Brian? Yeah, it kind of looks that way. It's exactly. Yeah. What it now remember, so class A shares, long-term horizon, large amount to vest. Class B shares are the contingent deferred sales load. That's for people who have a smaller amount to invest, long-term time horizon. And uh, there, if they stay five to seven years, not testable, 
they will turn the B shares into A shares. Well, thank you, Cedric. Uh, you're very nice. Do we always combine married couples? Uh, yeah, we married couples, we could combine if they have a combination privilege, yes. Uh, more often than not, Hog Hunter, that's not where we combine married couples. Every once in a while, I get like a question like, the wife owns 6% of the stock, he owns 5% of the stock. Are they a principal stockholder? The answer is yes. Husbands and wives on regulatory questions, Hog Hunter, are always considered to be acting in concert, right? So you would combine them. Same thing like, I haven't had anybody in Brian tell me in a long time they got a question about a husband and wife if it applies to position limits. That shows up on uh, the nine every now and again and the four, right? So assuming position limits are, and then they tell you the husband owns X number of contracts, right. wife owns uh, X number of contracts, you would combine them. Yes, from the same household. Yeah. I like your last name, Toussaint. Is that Toussaint? It sounds French, Cedric. It sounds oh, French. Toussaint. Very classy. I uh, got an 80. Oh, my goodness. Well, you're fine. Gee whiz. Wow. Yeah. Thank so, you well, I guess, you know, that's a, that, uh, that is, Hog Hunter, a champagne problem. A champagne problem. Champagne problems are not real problems. Would we like you not to memorize questions? The answer is yes. But if that is your problem and you're pulling 89, 90, 91, uh, we'll live with that. We'll live with that. Then he needs to take someone else's final. Yeah, take the test geek. You're going to drop a little bit. So you can get the hog hunter. You can get the test geek exam for uh, free on the channel where you can hit pause, watch me do it. But Brian, want to be very clear, we'll sell you the PDF for a little over 20 bucks. But all you get is the PDF on my and the practice test. And I don't know why people don't get that. Every once in a while, somebody will call Brian or me and say, Oh, I got was the PDF. And I said, Well, I think that's what we told you. Now, what I like about that, though, hog hunter, if you do uh, buy Brian's PDF of that, uh, what I tell people to do, Brian, is take their El Marco when they're done with it as a mark and El Marco the wrong answers. And the night before morning up, read the questions and the right answers. And then I tell them to read the rationales. You know, the reason I like to do that, Hog Hunter, is I think it's a good way to get you in the right circadian rhythm. Because it's not a natural thing to wake up and go, oh, I'm going to go take my seven. You know, so uh, that's how you can do it. Looks like we're getting close to the drawing. Thanks. You're welcome. A motto, how many questions and options? I on the SIE three or four max. Yeah. So exactly. again, if you tell me that you missed the options and that's why you failed, I'm gonna say there's bigger problems. Two I thought that right today in the SIE class, day two. I don't know, Amato, if you're joining me from my Kaplan class, uh, John is. And I felt bad because I could tell there were some people that were getting a little down on themselves and oh, I don't get this option stuff, and woe is me. And you know, I was trying to explain to them it's mostly recognition, like. When do options expire? When does the option agreement have to be back? So I still think that if you're taking the seven, I do agree, motto, then it's worth, you know, trying to get it down because it'll pay dividends for you on that seven for sure. But it's not going to be material to actually passing the SIE. Uh, using STC for series seven, overwhelmed by uh, balance sheets. I will link, I have a balance sheet lecture that may be helpful to you. And so I will link to that in the uh, video replay. I think all vendors go overboard on balance sheets as it applies to the Series 7. I Please note, to the Series 7. You know, on the 65, 66, there is some stuff of that. Uh, I don't know if I told you this, Brian, got good news. Uh, I do have permission from STC to put on the channel one of their practice tests on a shared screen. So I'm going to hope to have that up on uh, maybe a Saturday, Sunday, Monday, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, four or five on options. There you go. So John's giving you some feedback, right? Marcel, welcome. Oh man, of course I'm I owe you a mom when Marcel is in the house. He is one mom over forever. He came from New Orleans to Las Vegas. Uh, Marcel, when you come back, dinner is on me. Brian's telling me where you took me for that steak dinner is now changed over. And what what's it called William, now? Steak William out. B's. What's that? William B's. William B's is now that steakhouse. So William Boy. Yeah. Marcel uh, brought mom some beads and some uh, community coffee. And so, yeah, he's a, he's a favorite. I believe it's 25%. I'm not sure what that is an answer to, John. Uh, got it wrong, but why? <laughs> okay. So, I'm a market maker. So, I'm willing to buy 10 round lots into my inventory at 2260. Uh, I'm willing to sell 15 round lots out of my inventory at 2278. 
after accepting a customer limit order to sell. So the customer wants to sell with a limit order. He's on the same side as me, as the market maker. Yeah. Damn this customer. He's willing to sell for three cents less than I am. And so I have to display that to the market. And so now my new quote, because I have to display the limit order, is going to be 2260, 2275, 10 by 5. I have Rosie a whole lecture on this. And this is called limit order protection. Usually the customer is on the opposite side with a market order. In other words, if you give me a market order as a customer, you're going to sell at 2260. You're going to buy at 2278. So the first thing you have to do here, Rosie, is say, okay, this is a limit order. And now I got to look at what I'm willing to sell at. I'm willing to sell at 2278. And he's willing to sell at the same or better price than I have to display it. So the answer is the new quote will be adjusted to 2260. 2275, 10 by 5. Um, Rampart, is that going to be our guy word? <laughs> uh, yeah, he's telling me, move, move it along, Dean, move it along. All right, so let's see. 57, uh, a lot of that stuff. So a lot of that stuff, XJ, about uh, what I just went over. Uh, 100 million, uh, Nico's got some more balance sheet. Just send that to me, Nico. I'll do it in, uh, in a uh, video or an email with you or a Zoom with you. All right, I'm just seeing everybody okay. So you got to wait till I get the giveaway tool up. So it doesn't do you any good until I put this into the to the thing. So boom. Uh, Rampart is where uh, Brian and I uh, sometimes go to uh, do some gambling. Have an adult beverage for Have Rob. An adult beverage. <laughs> Uh-oh, what happened? Uh, did, am I still there? Are we still in the streaming or anything? There we go. Yeah, yeah you're still good. Okay, there. let me get the shared screen. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Yeah, that customer limit order does a, does a job okay. on people's heads. There we go. Okay, so. All right. Get rid of that. Hold on, I got to get rid of that XJ comment. Sorry, XJ. And then remember, you got to uh, give me an email within one hour that you are the winner. Whoop, that's not it. There we go. Okay, so we only have one entry. Is that it? Only one person wants to win uh, 30 minutes with yours truly? I get it. I wouldn't want to spend 30 minutes with me <laughs> either. But, uh, five entries. Nine entries. Uh, Mom loves her chips, Brian. I, I tried to tell her not every Friday night when I come back from the casino am I going to be a winner. <laughs> 13. Is that it? Last call. Last call for alcohol. Uh, by the way, we don't have last call in Vegas. So, all right, looks like that's it. So, let's do the drawing. Uh, Caesar, I think I owe you a coaching. Co Caesar again. So, I think Caesar, I owe you a call already. If I if I'm correct on that. That means this will be an hour instead of 30 minutes. So I think that uh, somehow we fell through the cracks. I think I owe you 30 minutes. So count on that being an hour if that is the case. All right. Well, remember, uh, inch by inch, your exams are a cinch. Yard by yard, your exams are hard. And Brian, you say? Keep it simple. Stay with what you know. You take the test. Don't let the test take you. All right, everybody, we'll see you next Tuesday. Same bat time, same bat channel.